Lecture One of The World of Sound, Six Lectures Delivered Before a Juvenile Auditory at the Royal Institution, Christmas 1919, by Sir William Bragg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Lecture One What is Sound? all around us are material objects of many kinds and it is quite difficult to move without shaking some of them more or less if we walk about on the floor it quivers a little under the fall of our feet if we put down a cup on the table we cannot avoid giving a small vibration to the table and the cup if an animal walks in the forest it must often shake the leaves or the twigs or the grass and unless it walks softly with padded feet it shakes the ground the motions may be very minute far too small to see but they are there nevertheless besides the obvious surroundings of material things there is an ocean of air in which we live we cannot move without stirring it and moreover whenever we make anything else move as when we shake the ground or the branches or the table or whatever it may be the air is shaken too because it touches all these objects and moves when they move it is very easy to set the air quivering and when once a quiver is started it runs through the air in all directions till it has spread and weakened and died away also it is a very curious thing that the air can carry ever so many quivers at the same time going in many different directions and of many varieties but each travels as if there were no other there we will presently consider an experimental illustration of this fact now since nothing can be done without starting shakes and quivers in solids or in liquids or in air in some or all of them and since it is very important to everyone to know what is happening round about him so far as it is possible to do so it is not surprising to find that we human beings and most animals possess organs especially fitted to detect these shakes and quivers and that we make great use of them the ear is marvellously sensitive to the minute quiverings that come to it through the air and then pass down the tube of the ear and come finally to the delicate organs within we say that we hear a sound which means that somewhere or other an air quiver has been started and has reached our ears as the life and processes of the world go on the actions which take place are accompanied by these tremors and we live in this world of sound we can interpret what we hear because all the tremors are different and we have learnt to know them all we can tell the sort of tremor that is made by the rustle of the leaves from the sort that is made by thunder or the call of an animal in fact it seems quite absurd to think that there is anything wonderful in it because the sound seems so different but of course that is just where the wonder lies only air tremors in every case and yet the ear has such marvellous powers that it can sort them all out from each other can tell one person's voice from another can tell one word from another can even tell by the minutely differing shades of inflection the spirit that lies behind the word the more one thinks about it the more wonderful one finds it to be no doubt the reason why ears can be and are so finely trained is because the information they give is so important and so interesting sometimes it is a matter of life or death as in the case of the animal who hunts or of the animal that is hunted it is everything to us to be able to talk to our friends to use our voices and to set in motion air quiverings that have special meanings to those that hear them if we walked in the country how much we should miss if we could not hear the birds or the wind or the brook or the passers-by 
think what it would mean to us if we could have no singing and no music the quiverings of the air and our ears that hear them link us closely to the world about us and to our fellow creatures in this first lecture i want to show you some of the things that happen when sound tremors pass from place to place and first of all we will repeat some of the experiments that tyndall used to show in this room half a century ago perhaps you do not all know that tyndall was a very famous lecturer on the staff of the royal institution he gave once a series of lectures on the laws of sound which he illustrated by beautiful experiments most of the apparatus which he used is still here and it will be quite interesting to use some of it once again in the basement of this building two floors below us there is a powerful musical box it is playing now but we do not hear it because none of the quivers which it makes whether in the air or the floor or the walls is strong enough to get to us they cannot come by the air because there are floors and shut doors which they cannot pass through easily and they do not come by way of the walls because the quivers which get into the floor and walls are far too weak but there is a long rod which rests on the musical box and comes up to this room through holes in the floors which are between up this rod the quivers come quite strongly if i put my ear to the rod i can hear the musical box very plainly there are probably few in the audience who can hear it and the reason for that is that the rod is so small in cross-section that when the quivers reach the end they do not give enough motion to the air some bigger surface is wanted which will take the motion from the rod and be broad enough to shake the air over a large surface when a tea tray is put onto the top of the rod everyone can hear the musical box with ease a violin does just as well even a soft felt hat makes the music plain the chain of communications is now complete first of all the springs in the musical box are shaken by the mechanism then the quivers run into the sounding board they come up the rod and by means of the broad surface of the violin or other object they are given to the air in such quantity that even allowing for the spreading through the room they are strong enough to affect every ear that they reach observe too that there is no mistaking the nature of the source the notes are obviously those of a musical box the rod the tray the violin the hat have merely handed on the vibrations with little change it is a very common practice as we shall see later to use a large surface for the purpose of launching enough movement into the air as we have used the violin the experiment we have just made illustrates the passage of sound along a solid body in this case the long rod it is easy to find many other examples the water pipes in the house often carry sounds sometimes there is a singing or a hammer in the pipes when a tap is opened or closed and the sound runs along the pipes into other rooms we all know the thrilling moments in the stories of adventure when the hero puts his ear to the ground and hears the thudding of the feet of the pursuing horses in the string telephones that have sometimes been so popular the sound runs along the tightly stretched thread people who have lost the power of hearing through the air may still in some cases hear music when they rest one end of a rod on the sounding board of a musical instrument and put the other end to their teeth the sound runs through the bones of the head and reaches in this way the mechanism of the inner ear which must of course be uninjured sound can be conveyed by liquids as well as by solids in some of the experiments carried out for the admiralty during the war an underwater buzzer was used it is a small watertight metal case in which a hammer is made by electrical means to rain blows upon one of the sides when i lower it into a tank of water and put it into action by pressing an electrical key it sounds out loudly through the room 
the hammer in the buzzer starts vibrations in the metal case and these run through the water to the walls and so out into the air the sound has been carried by the water over one part of its journey next we must show the passage of sound through the air and we will make use of another of tyndall's famous experimental illustrations under this large glass cover there is a clockwork mechanism which can ring a bell the bell is supported by elastic strings which do not carry sound at all well so that when it rings the sound if it gets to our ears must have come through the air the quivers of the bell launch a quivering motion into the air which gets to the glass wall of the cover and starts it in motion in its turn the glass shakes the air outside and the quivers once more run through air and finally reach our ears now the cover stands on a plate to which it is firmly waxed down there is a hole at the centre of the plate which opens into a pipe communicating with an air pump the air pump is worked and gradually the air is drawn away from underneath the cover when there is little air left we notice that the sound of the bell has become much weaker and at last when every trace of air has been removed it dies away altogether that shows that the air was wanted to carry the sound when we let the air in again the bell sounds out as before we have now heard sounds travelling through solid bodies such as the rod that came from the musical box in the basement through the water in the tank and through the air of the room and we have observed that when there is neither solid nor liquid nor gas sound is not conveyed at all it cannot travel across what we call a vacuum between us and the sun there is space more empty of gas or air or any other substance even than the glass container which we used just now no sound can travel across such a space light on the other hand travels quite easily light and our eyes that see it deal with the doings of the whole universe sound belongs to the world only i may talk of the universe of light but i can only talk of the world of sound as soon as you understand that sound is a quivering motion which goes from one place to another you will realize that most likely it takes a certain time to make the journey and so it does when for example a sound travels through the air it takes nearly five seconds to go a mile and it is a very strange thing that all sorts of sounds shrill whistles and deep boomings take just the same amount of time to travel if a band is playing a long way away you hear all the instruments keeping time correctly with each other piccolo and cornet and drum no matter how far away they are if some sounds travelled more quickly than others you would only be able to hear music properly when you are quite close to it it is a very common thing to find examples of the fact that sound takes time to travel if you are standing on one side of a valley and you watch a train approach a station a mile or two away on the other side you may notice when the steam first issues in a white cloud from the whistle as the engine driver gives warning that he is coming and light travels so fast that you see the steam practically on the instant that the engine driver opens his whistle but it may be many seconds before you hear it I have often watched the woodcutters at work in Australia, where the clear, still air makes it easy to see and hear at long distances. From one side of a wide gully, I have seen the strokes of the axe fall noiselessly far away on the other side. And then, when the man has straightened himself and begun to move away, the noise of the blows has reached my ears. If you watch a long procession going along a street marching to the music that heads it every man puts his foot down at the beat of the drum but of course the rear ranks do not hear it as soon as the front ranks 
so that really they do not march in step if you look sharply you will see a ripple run along the line as the heads go up and down slightly to the movement of the feet sound travels at different rates through different substances for example it travels about fifteen times as fast through iron as it does through the air you can make an experiment on this in the park or anywhere else where you can get a long uninterrupted stretch of iron railing if you put your ear to the railing and get a friend to strike it with a hammer a hundred yards or so away you hear the sound twice first it comes by the iron and afterwards through the air in water sound travels about four times as fast as in air it has been necessary as we shall see later to measure this velocity very carefully during the war in the air the actual rate is nearly eleven hundred feet per second as the pulses go to greater and greater distances from their source they spread over wider and wider surfaces and become weaker the farther away the source of sound is from the listener the feebler it seems to be but if we wish to do so we can prevent the sound from spreading itself over wide surfaces and it will then carry much farther as for example when we use speaking tubes which carry the sound pulses with little loss for quite considerable distances the walls of the tubes inside ought to be smooth because if they are not the rubbing of the air against the walls as it moves to and fro when the quivers pass over it spoils the true shape of the waves turning them into little whirlpools in which the energy is wasted moreover there must be no sharp corners no right angles in the tubes because at a corner some of the sound is reflected and goes back the way it came when a man uses a speaking trumpet he does something of this kind also because the trumpet tends to direct the sound in the way the speaker wants it to go but the action of the speaking trumpet depends more on the fact that the speaker can actually get a greater amount of sound out of his own throat you feel that you are working harder when you are using one the rigid walls of the trumpet do not allow the sound waves to spread sideways very readily and in a sense hold them for the vocal organs to work on when the sound spreads away without the artificial confinement of a speaking tube or anything of that kind it is sure to run up against obstacles of one kind or another what happens to it then is really a subject of great importance i think you will find it easier to understand this and many other problems connected with the spreading of sound waves if you take the analogous case of waves on the surface of water if you watch what happens to ripples in various cases you will be much more able to understand what happens in the case of sound here is a ripple tank made for the purpose of such experiments it is a shallow trough about a yard square with a plate glass bottom filled with a thin layer of water about a quarter of an inch deep underneath it on the floor is a naked arc light the light comes up through the tank and then falls on a sloping mirror which reflects it on the wall footnote the mirror is not necessary when there is a flat ceiling on which the ripple movements can be followed by the audience without difficulty End of footnote. any ripples which are made on the surface of the water show like lines of light and shade on the screen if i touch the water with my finger circular ripples spread away just as you have often seen them do when a stone is dropped into a pond the ripples fade away as the circles become wider so does the energy of the sound die away as it spreads from its source and even faster than the ripples do on the water if i touch in two places at once two sets of interlacing ripples start out notice at once how each set goes on its own way right through the other set as if it was not there probably you have noticed this effect also on the surface of a lake or the sea this is really a point of the very greatest importance to us 
for it means that in the case of sound any number of sounds can use the air at the same time which is a much more wonderful thing than one is apt to imagine at first sight suppose it did happen that when a sound was travelling across a certain airspace no other sound could go that way at the same time or suppose that two or more sounds when trying to cross the same place at the same time had some effect on each other what a complete confusion of all speech and sound there would be no ear could ever disentangle it it is therefore a most remarkable and important thing that however much sound is crossing an airspace a new sound can find its way across that space just as easily as if no other sound were there i do not say of course that the ear which has already been filled with various sounds will be as sensitive to a new sound as if there had been silence until the new one came next we notice in the ripple tank that waves are reflected at the boundaries of the tank sometimes we see this effect on the shore of the sea or of a lake or in the bath but here it is shown more regularly if i produce a succession of waves following one another at steady intervals the reflections and the original waves acting together cover the surface of the water with a beautiful diamond-shaped pattern whose motion across the screen is quite interesting to follow the original waves and the reflected waves are equally inclined as you see to the reflecting surface this illustrates a very important phenomenon in sound or for that matter in any other form of wave motion waves beating up against a plane surface are thrown back in such a way that the new lines of waves make the same angle with the surface as the old this is really the essential property of the ordinary mirror or looking-glass by which you see behind it an image of objects which are really in front the light waves that roll up against the mirror from the source in front are thrown back and seem to us to have come from behind the same effect occurs with sound waves and then we speak of hearing an echo especially when the reflecting surface is so far away that we hear the echo some time after the original sound is made so that the reflection is heard separately and distinctly another very pretty way of watching reflection in the ripple tank is to set down in it a wooden square enclosing a little pond if we jerk the wooden square waves roll backwards and forwards from side to side and make a pattern on the screen like a scotch tartan keeping the square at rest and touching the water at some point inside it we get circular ripples which are reflected at the sides notice how the reflected ripples are also circular but that their centre is on the other side of the wall which has reflected them and just as far behind it as the starting point was in front the centre is the image of the real source and is denoted by the letter i in the figure a curved surface has very special properties here is a piece of brass shaped into the form of a parabola if i roll a wave into the mouth of it observe how the waves are gradually turned into circular waves moving in on to their centre the point on which they converge is called the focus of the parabola if i dip my finger into the water at the focus exactly the reverse effect takes place circular waves spread out from the point which are converted by the parabola into waves with a straight front you know that bicycle lamps and motor lamps are often made with parabolic reflectors and that the light itself is put at the focus the light is thus sent out in a straight shaft without spreading curved surfaces like this have the power of concentrating waves on to particular points so in some of the great reflecting telescopes the parabolic mirror gathers the light from a star and focuses it on to the field of view of the observer who studies it there through the eyepiece 
here is a block of wood with a long row of nails sticking out from it like a rake when this row of nails is put into the water in place of the blocks which i was previously using as reflectors you will notice that most of the energy of the waves passes through and between the nails but it is clearly seen that a little of it is reflected there is an interesting parallel in the case of sound sound is reflected not only from a flat and complete surface but even from a set of iron railings or from the foliage of a tree so when you are driving along in a motor car you can often hear reflections from the fences and hedges that you pass if it is a long way to the hedge on either side there is much less noise than when the hedges close in on you there is a sudden change in the nature of the sound when you have been running between let us say steep banks and come to an iron railway bridge or to a paling fence if there is a row of posts that you pass you can notice that each sends to you a little special reflection so that you get as it were a regular succession of whispers into your ear footnote a whisper consists mostly of high-pitched notes and it is such that are reflected in this way End footnote. if we dip the nails simultaneously into the water each nail starts circular ripples and the many sets join finally into a straight wave when you come to a deeper study of optics you will find in this pretty experiment an illustration of what is known as the principle of huygens i am presently going to put aside the ripple tank and take up another means of following the behavior of sound waves but we need one last experiment with the tank in order to explain the reason for our change of course notice that when a set of ripples moves past the edge of an obstacle they swing round it if we put two blocks of wood side by side so as to leave a little opening or gate and roll up waves against the gate the portion that gets through opens out at once into semicircular waves which fill all the space on the other side so does a great ocean wave surge through the narrow opening into a harbour sending in a disturbance which spreads and fills the harbour with commotion this thing always happens when the length of the wave is as large as the opening of the harbour or indeed in any way comparable with it but if i open the gate in the ripple tank and make waves succeed one another very quickly so that the ripples are now much closer together than the posts of the gate then there is really a stream of waves across the tank which does not spread to left and right anything like so much as before the walls have as it were cast a definite shadow you will often see this at the mouth of the harbour when a gentle wind blows in ripples which carry forward in a stream some way within the entrance exactly the same thing happens in the case of sound where the long waves which as we shall see later give deep notes sweep round corners easily it is the tiny waves i e the very high notes of which alone shadows can be cast by objects of ordinary size in this next series of experiments we are going to use sound waves themselves but we cannot with any satisfaction use ordinary sound the distances between the successive waves of such sounds as the voice or the note of an organ pipe or a tuning fork are anything from one to several feet if we tried to block them by obstacles or turn them by reflecting surfaces they would scarcely obey us at all the waves swing round obstacles which are of the same size as the distances between the waves just as the ripples did in the tank if we are to handle actual sound waves they must be such as belong to high-pitched sounds it is a very old question this one of the great questions of physics one which troubled newton himself he found it hard to admit that light might consist of waves of any kind because he thought that if it did the waves should be able to swing round the edges of obstacles 
that we should in fact be able to see round the corner just as we can hear round the corner a light on one side of a screen cannot be seen from the other but the voice of a speaker can be heard when the light he is holding is invisible the explanation lies in the fact that the wavelength of sound is a matter of feet whereas in the case of light it is a matter of hundred thousandths of an inch so the light shadows are sharp and definite but sound shadows are apt to be vague and partial we must then use very high-pitched sounds if we are going to carry out experiments with rays of sound in this room and the higher the pitch the better because high pitch goes with short waves we will therefore use a whistle so high in pitch that probably it is out of range for most people in this room they will not hear it at all but here is a so-called sensitive flame gas is forced under great pressure eight to ten inches of water along a narrow tube from which it emerges through a very small circular nipple into the open air where it burns in a tall narrow flame it is on the point of flaring if the pressure on the gas were increased a little more the gas in its hurry to get out would churn itself up into little whirlpools mix with the air and burn in a noisy blue flame but not only will extra pressure cause this to happen any high-pitched sound will do the same it appears that such a sound disturbs the even flow of the gas just where it comes out of the nipple so that in this case also the turbulent flow and the mixing with the air give the blue flaring flame here are the whistles so high in pitch that they are difficult to hear but you see that they affect the flame even though i go as far away from it as i can and blow the whistle gently at each blast it ducks in the most marked way if anybody in the room will drop one coin on another or rattle a bunch of keys the flame will respond instantly every time the letter s occurs in what i say the flame responds all these sounds are essentially of high pitch here then we have a flame sensitive to the very sounds which we want to use and to them only tyndall used this sensitive flame largely and i believe that some of the apparatus on the table is just as he left it and as he described it in his book on sound the specially high-pitched whistle known as a bird call was not known to him but the late lord rayleigh made great use of it it consists of two pieces of thin metal brass or tin perhaps half an inch across placed parallel to one another at a distance of a tenth of an inch or even less two very small holes perhaps a fiftieth of an inch in diameter are bored through the two parallel pieces so as to face one another exactly this arrangement is now soldered on to the end of a piece of brass tubing and a steady stream of air is forced along the tube in order to sound the call these dimensions can be varied considerably the smaller they are and the finer the holes the higher is the pitch with a special piece of apparatus due to tyndall consisting of two tubes hinged together it is easy to show the reflection of sound the waves come down one tube and if any suitable object is placed as a reflector they are thrown back along the other and cause the flame to flare you will see that a board or a piece of glass or a sheet of paper can all reflect these sounds a piece of linen does not reflect much until it is wetted when it becomes quite a good reflector in these experiments we are doing with the waves of sound exactly what we did with ripples in the tank causing them to be reflected at flat surfaces there is another way in which the reflection of waves by a flat surface can be shown very easily 
first of all consider this curious property of the sensitive flame which rayleigh described and found very useful it is not equally sensitive to sounds coming from all directions this particular flame is deaf to the whistle when i place it in position a and very sensitive when i turn it round to position b the peculiarity is probably due to some irregularity in the shape of the nipple let us place it in the first of these two positions so that it no longer responds to the bird call when i hold the mirror in the position shown in the figure it responds readily because a reflected beam of sound is being thrown upon it a still more striking experiment shows the reflection by a curved mirror here is a concave or hollowed mirror which is used to reflect light and to focus it upon a point we will use it to focus both light and sound we place an electric lamp just over the bird call and mount a piece of paper just below the sensitive flame i stand quite a long way from both bird call and flame which latter i have put into the position which is insensitive to the direct action of the whistle and hold the mirror so that it collects a bundle of light rays from the lamp and focuses them on the paper when this is done the sound waves from the bird call are focused on the nipple whence the gas issues which is as i have said the sensitive point of the flame and so you see it flares violently the least movement of the mirror up or down right or left so that the light no longer falls on the paper and the flame rises up and becomes silent again there is one more experiment which i should like to show a little more difficult to understand but it is a beautiful one and very few people have seen it it is due to lord rayleigh i turn the flame so that it is not entirely deaf to the bird call and then place a flat mirror so that the sound of the bird call passes over the flame and is reflected back perpendicularly by the glass there are now two sets of waves sweeping over the flame in opposite directions and their combination results in the formation of what are called stationary waves waves which rise and fall without moving forward they may be seen sometimes when waves roll up against a vertical cliff and recoil therefrom in such cases there are places at regular intervals where the water does not move up and down at all while in between such places the water rises and falls alternately so in the case where sound waves and their reflections are travelling opposite ways over the same part of the air there are places where the air does not move such places are called nodes in between them the air is in motion vibrating to and fro for some positions of the flat mirror the flame happens to be in one of the lines where there is no motion and it does not flare but if the reflector is moved a little farther away or a little closer the jet flares and if the motion of the reflector is continued the flame is once more silent then once more noisy and so on it is easy to count forty or fifty such alternations it is possible to measure the wavelength of the sound in this way when sound spreads away through air or water or a solid it weakens because it spreads but there is also a second cause of weakening which in some substances is very effective there is in fact a real loss of energy as the sound tries to go through any substance and we speak of the absorption of sound of sound absorbing substances and so on the silent cabinets for telephones are packed round with felt or cork dust or something of the kind some substance generally which is much divided and contains many air pockets there is a convenient way of studying such effects which we can easily try here is a tuning fork 
it is made to vibrate but is not audible until i stand it upon its proper box then the sound rings out loudly now let us put various materials between the fork and the box and see if the sound will get through wood and metal and such hard things are quite transparent to the sound even a cork or a piece of rubber transmits a fair amount a ball of wool does not cut off the sound entirely when the fork is pressed firmly on it a lump of soft car grease transmits sound quite well one of the best insulators of all is a pneumatic cushion and that is why it is a good thing to put an air cushion under your pillow when you are sleeping in the train or to use a pneumatic tyre when you want to support some apparatus which is to be kept free from vibration end of lecture one of the world of sound